Welcome to the End of Slavery Summit. I'm your host, Corey Angelot, here with a very special guest, somebody who, if you're troubled in this time of confusion and so much is going on, may be able to put you at ease. He's a life coach and a craftsman into the restoration of freedom through reverence for truth and the reformation of the individual, starting with himself. He had his own personal journey and helped so many others out on their journey, and I'm sure he'll be able to to help uh, with your journey as well. Uh, he is the author of Uncompromised, When You're Ready to Live Your Life on Your Terms, and The Uncompromised Journal, Your Life on Your Terms. His website is ronrenaud.com. That's R-O-N-R-E-N-A-U-D. And if that gives it away, my guest today is Ron Renaud. Welcome. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks a lot, man. Good to have, great to be here, Corey. Yeah, help us through the confusion of what's going on in our world. What could people make of this? As a life coach, how do you how do you start to integrate these ideas into people's lives of really freeing their mind and helping them accept the the current world to move themselves forward into it with ease? Yeah, well, you know, there's a, where do you start in this conversation? <laughs> you know, one of the things that I was really influenced by, and I still am influenced by uh, Ralph Waldo Emerson, which most folks, you know, these days don't know anything about Emerson, but uh, it's, you know, sort of, uh, he gave America its sort of founding philosophy and uh, he's well worth checking out, but he wrote a book called History, or wrote an essay called History. And one of the great things I've gleaned from that and taken into my work is that all history is biography and all biography is history. But if we don't know ourselves um, it's going to go to answer the first question you offered a moment ago. If we don't know ourselves, we don't know our proclivity to do stupid stuff, to set ourselves up for extraordinary failure. If we don't know the part of ourselves that will just work so incredibly hard to push through to experience freedom or joy or whatever that is. If we're not aware of the things that it takes to go from point A to point B. If we don't know that about ourselves, we're not going to understand how the how we got where we are and certainly not understand what's happening in our world. So to me, you know, most people who do the, the work I do are not looking at it from the perspective of, you know, freedom is the chief end of man. Uh, and, um, you know, the idea, well, that philosoph uh, philosophical underpinning that I just mentioned, because if you can understand that, understand myself and go, oh, look, I've lied to myself. I've scammed and pretended this so I can get that and then shot myself in the foot and crashed my life. Oh, well, do you think people who go to Washington or Brussels or Sacramento or Albany, you think they might be doing the same thing behind closed doors with your money and also come out making themselves look pretty like you and I have done too, Corey? Yeah, probably. And so when we can remove the cloak of somehow when people go behind closed doors, whether it be at a church, whether it be, you know, uh, you know, in a civil government of some kind or anywhere else, that they're somehow made of better stuff or special stuff, then we can go, oh, wait, the same patterns of revolution and breakthrough and reformation and um, enlightenment that I go on in a moment, as well as in a, you know, an hour, a week, a day and a lifetime, you know, over and over repeated, hopefully and a trajectory towards more freedom and more responsibility and better, being the better version of myself. If I can understand that, then I can so apparently see the lies of history, the truth of history, what's going on right now, and be better prepared for it. Because in the end of the day, what we're talking about is how do I be responsible for myself, my family, um, ultimately myself, um, to create a better world? And that's where it starts. So how to make it easier, how to... I deal with the truth. I'm a big fan of, I've got a, a one liner I say all the time, which is know the truth and don't compromise. You know, it's like get, you got to get strong enough to deal with that, which is actually going on. And that's what you're saying. It starts, and you're saying it starts with yourself, right? Of course. Of course. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah so you have this concept of self authority or external authority, right? Or maybe you can say it as self master or external master in the case of slavery, right? So as a coach, like interpret here for me this notion of self-authority versus or external authority. Like, do these coexist? I think they do coexist. And frankly, the folks in our community tend to be like, no, no rulers, no masters, no slaves. Rawr, I'm going to listen to my music. I'm going to do whatever I want. It's like, yeah, but there's a degree of, I think oftentimes a gross degree of unconsciousness. You got a good, cool guitar back there. If you live <laughs> with somebody, you're not going to jam at 2.30 in the morning. You're just not. I'm free. I can do whatever I want. Yeah, and you can get you get punched in the face by the guy upstairs or whatever else because if you're not 
this is the huge leap that we're going to have to make at some point. It's sort of, um, have you ever heard that expression? You have to take your foot off a of first base to steal second. No, it's a great one though. Right. Yeah. And to me, it's like, okay, if I'm going to get to second base, if I'm going to get to no rulers, no, uh, external authority through coercion, because you probably play guitar far better than I do. I might hire you. I might want you to be an authority over me and I can choose to stay or leave, but that's a, that's a different species of, um, authority. Um, for me to be able to coexist with you, with your guitar and my guitar drums or whatever, we're going to have to obey something higher, a higher law, a moral law, the natural law, right? God's law, whatever you want to call it. And until we really start leaning into that, that's why I say the work has to start with me, Ron Renaud, and not everybody else should be doing better. Everybody else is like, yeah, they probably should, but I got to make sure I keep my side of the street clean before I'm too brisk at pointing out how everybody else lacks. So yeah, you can, you know, the idea of, of external, uh, of throwing off external authority starts with self-mastery and being your own master, right? Obeying the higher moral law in your own life. Otherwise you just set yourself up to, uh, you know, you start jamming at two o'clock in the morning, then someone is going to exert their authority over you because they're going to stop you. It's like, okay, so then what do we need mm. to be listening to? I say we need to be getting quiet, thinking, <laughs> listening to intuition. And in that way, we're going to do a lot better for ourselves and certainly others. Yeah. Yeah. I totally understand what you're saying. It's a good analogy at <laughs> the guitar in the background. Um, <laughs> yeah. But, you know, and, and what is it that troubles that individual that hears that loud noise? Is it is it something within their own intuition that says, man, I can't I can't deal with this noise. I need to take the step of authority and. And, and stop that noise? It's a good question. C.S. Lewis has a great one-liner, and uh, it, it's going to reinforce a point that I think we already have in common here, which is like, he was a Christian, but he was, he was, he's so articulate of a guy, such a good guy to read if anybody hasn't read him, uh, because he, he ties in so many other faiths and philosophies that recognize there is a higher moral law. You may not understand it through the myth I do, but... Um, he said, you know, there's none of us that, uh, every single one of us, when we get out of a chair and we, you know, maybe use the bathroom or something, we come back and somebody's sitting in our chair, we're like, wait, we know that there's something wrong here. <laughs> something happened here. That's not fair. Well, and so it is with you jamming at two in the morning and like, well, that guy's got a problem with inner authority. No, there's a common understanding of this is the time when we sleep or I should, I'm right. sleeping and you know that, and you chose to not care. And I may choose to come down with fists flying, or I may come down with, and hopefully this is, you know, what I would do is say, dude, you're killing me. Can we do something with the music? And, oh my gosh. And this is, of course, would be perfect, right? Oh, Ron, I don't know what I was thinking. I just, I was mad about this and I just started playing and I should have turned it way down. I should have put it on my, my headphones mm -hmm. and I'm sorry, it won't happen again. Now what happens is you and I get closer together because I had the hard conversation. You took 100% responsibility instead of sh shirking it or throwing it off on me and calling me names. Now we have aggression happening rather than you recognizing, yeah, I did make a mistake. Hmm. Boy, imagine that. Now you and I are tight because we know we can have a hard conversation, work together. Next time you can say, hey, Ron, I don't know what you're doing. You're getting home from work. You're kicking your boots off or something. But every time you do that, whatever, now we're able to have that kind of conversation. The funny part is with this stuff, and this is why, you know, there's the, the line from, I don't know if it was James Madison who said something about uh, if men were angels, there'd be no use for government. Uh, but since men aren't angels, we need government. Okay, well then enter, uh, who's our man there? Um, um, uh, the uh, greatest superstition. Larkin Rose. Larkin Rose, who talked about, okay, great. So we're going to take a, a subset of these crazy sons of guns who won't listen, you know, won't do the right thing and put them in charge of all of us. It doesn't work. But this is the limbo we find ourselves in is, you know, if I can't have this conversation with you and you and I do this without aggression, you know, happening then something is going to step up and either you're going to knock me out to get me off your back or I'm going to do it to you. And it's like, well, now here we are. Now it's going to be, uh, we're going to have this thing always going on between us, or there's going to be it just under the radar with a smile over the top of it. But just the same is that's, that's, that's oppression. That's well, none of us want to live under the, under the guise of peace while there's this undercurrent of coercion going on. Hmm. So it means we have to all get better ourselves and um, obviously at this point, we're all looking at freedom cells or whatever you want to call them of one way or another is getting around excellent people who have the idea in mind where how do we take care of each other? How do we live peaceably? 
but uh, to your point before, it's like, yeah, it, it does. We have to start with ourselves. And so long as we're not at peace with ourselves, we're going to create a lot of, a, a lot of mess outside of ourselves. So. And, and if it does start with ourselves, maybe there's an extent to which maybe some people are afraid of themselves. Uh, like, look at the analogy you used. I, I thought of, well, look, look at psychopaths and how they don't feel empathy for other people. So if somebody told them, like, man, I don't I don't like what you're doing. Do, do they really know what they're doing? Do they really care about what they're doing? You know, there's a question there. And I think anybody who you know wants to learn from you or me, they have a care going into this saying, yeah, I want to learn. I want to see how I can better my life and, and, and do better things to the world in general, not just for myself, but for right. other people. So, um, you know, and I think it's scary for some people also to, to sense like, what if, you know, there's all these things happening in the world and they start to delve deeper into this rabbit hole of all these things that are bad, right? And they, and they have this empathy, sort of like, man, this is, here's, there's evil here, there's evil there. They start to wake up and see, well, what is going on here? This is why we're confused. But is this how we should think? Like, should we be scared of how we may be enslaved mentally? Should, is this how we should think? How do we escape That's that great. mindset? Yeah, well, you know what I think... You know, I mentioned something when we first started talking. It's, you know, know the truth and don't compromise. You know, know the truth of what's going on, and then we got to grow strong enough to deal with it. And I, I, I do believe that is a, an important starting place is, you know, you mentioned these people that are, would say, waking up. I mean, we're all waking up. We're all seeing things a little more clearly. Oh, you mean it's not the republic? I mean, that's, we can all remember a time, probably, we walk through conservatism at some level. It's like, those Democrats are crazy. And you're like, yeah, that's way better than when you were a Democrat or Boy, the Demo a lot of these Republicans are crazy too. It's like, yeah, you are opening, you're waking up more and more. And so I never want to put myself on a pedestal like, oh, I'm fully awake. We're all still waking up and seeing more and more. But the idea is, yeah, now what are you going to do with what you know? Because that's what makes us free. Because you and I are both going to make mistakes. But if I know that I'm supposed to not eat these peanut butter cookies or something like that, and I do it anyway, then I'm a slave. I'm a disciple of, I'm disciplined to eat do the thing I don't really want to do. Yeah. Right. And the same thing goes with, um, you know, I know that I shouldn't be voting or voting in this way. I know I shouldn't be living in this way that promotes statism of one kind or another, or, and yet we keep doing it. Well, then you're a slave to something and it's something that you can do something with. And to me, that's, that's exciting because, you know, there's the idea of, you know, we all have our idea of what a hero is, but man, oh man, I love the stories of the guys and I'm sure gals too on history who standing on the gallows are still joking and laughing and with, with confidence in their being right uh, and the rectitude of their behavior right to the very end. That's a real man or woman, right? But that's a real man. And uh, that's how I want to live is do right to the best of my ability now again and again. And so I think that's what need the, the conversation needs to be is slowing down, listening to what's going on inside oneself, get far better at that and um, acting it out. I mean, we could both probably jump on public schools where we learn straight away. You got to ask permission to go to the bathroom. These are the important subjects. Meanwhile, all your creativity, there's no time for it. Cramped out, cramped out. It's like, mm. well, what point do I start to trust my, my subtle urgings and my intuitions and my, my creativity and my passions? Yeah, there's no time for it. You got to go to 16 years of school. So it creates a slave mindset for us. And then here we are trying to unyoke ourselves. But hmm. yeah. So yeah, the, the school system is, is uh, forming individuals' minds. If per se, like you said, the individual is not in control of their own mind, right? Are they going to be more vulnerable to the school's influence? Yeah, well, I, mean, I think that's the, that's the whole purpose of uh, public school, right? Is to create interchangeable parts that are, will follow orders um, not question authority, be grateful. You know, I used to, when I first started coaching, uh, it struck me, you know, right. When you're younger, you're like, Oh, success is having all that money and the wife and the blah, blah. And then at some point it went, wait a second, you see like Kiplinger's magazine. There's always the gray guy, the guy with the gray hair and he's on the sailboat. And I thought like, what a scam. That is not success to me, but they teach you. You'd be a good boy or girl. You go through your 12 years. If you're a really good student, you can pay, you know, 50000 a year to go to one of our crappy schools to be less in touch with yourself, but to now be educated. And maybe you can become a doctor, which <laughs> don't get us both started today on what it means to be a doctor these days. Um, 
you know, maybe not understanding the very basics of health, but of course, of course, health being uh, uh, the derivative of uh, some petroleum based Rockefeller funded uh, <laughs> something. It's like, yeah, you go through enough of that education. There is no space. And this is why we're banging around all over each other because we're, you know, we're, we, we, we simply don't know ourselves. We take that upset and aggression and confusion out on others rather than getting quiet and obeying that part, part of ourselves. So that's, that's my thought. In, in part of the summit, you actually gave people a downloadable workbook, right, called Uncompromised Accountability. Do you think this can help individuals uh, do exactly as you just said, like help people be in touch with their own intuition? Yeah, please. And please share that, you know, put that, put that link in the, um, you know, in, in the description if you'd like. But yeah. It's a free download. It's um, it's it's sort of the highlights of my um, my uncompromised journal, and um, you know the idea behind it is how can I get people going with a free resource that you can print out as many copies as you want, where in the morning you get really clear about what you need to do, who you need to be, what kind of man or woman do you need to be to follow through, and actually do these things you know you need to do. Sign your name. Get really conscious. I'm saying these things are important. These things will be. Um, I'm a big fan of, look, if freedom is the name of the game in life, when we act, if we are talkers about freedom, then what we're saying is, hey, by doing this thing, by acting the way you see right here, I'm bringing more freedom in the world. And if you are acting in a way that's contrary to that, you're sabotaging yourself, you know it deep down, it eats away at you, then we end up medicating it with drugs, you know, whatever your drug of choice is, booze, porn, shopping, gossip sleeping, whatever. Um, and so the idea is get really clear about what you know, get conscious, sign your name, follow through and do it in the evening. There's a part then to follow through in the evening, get clear about how you did at following through and to doing what you said. And then it's like, no feel bads, no feel bads required or feel bad just enough to be an impulse to change and then do better tomorrow. That's it. So yeah, I'd love to, you know, definitely share that with folks. It's a great way to get really conscious and take an inventory of where you are with your own, you know, your own uh, word with yourself. Yeah, that's, that's fantastic. You know, I've always been journaling. Journaling has always yeah. helped me uh, just through all my explorations, just questioning the world around me, putting my thoughts on paper and then seeing it over time. I actually have a rule in my journals. Don't delete anything that I put in. <laughs> that's because, great. Because then I could look back at my own thoughts and see how my own mentality was. So it's interesting that you mentioned before that history is biography or that biography is history. Because what I see essentially is when you journal, you're basically writing your life or your own thoughts. You're basically, I mean, you maybe say that you're making history because you're expressing yourself and allowing your expression to be seen. But also you're writing down your life story. That's a biography. So it's interesting yeah, how that works. Absolutely. Well, and, you know, you mentioned you don't ever delete anything. Well, why? Because if you look at your journals five years ago, you're like, oh, my gosh, this was my stage where it was all about me. I didn't care yeah. about anybody else. I thought I was the smartest. And you're like, look where I am now. And you can see. And then you, again, if you can take that, that one arc and go, wait, where in time have Canadians or Americans or Belgians or whatever been so insulated or so driven to do their own thing? And, you know, who cares about anybody else or whatever? Oh yeah. Manifest destiny. Go westward. Never mind the natives there. Just cr it's like, oh my gosh, I lived like that. I now get and see this is the thing again with state with um, you know, uh, libertarians or or anarchists or volunteerists, how we can really get an attitude, a chip on our shoulder, like we are the height of morality. But if you can, you know, I use that example for you as if you know I knew anything about you in that regard. But you know, if we can go, oh, I was a selfish person prick in my early 20s i was mean to my mother i talked to my friends like they were a bunch of idiots i i i i, I blackballed all these people and maybe i owe apologies and maybe whatever but now at 32 oh man i got i gotta make some amends or i at least have to clean up my act right here then you can go oh i can see a young country would spend 25 million for the louisiana purchase and then just Freaking get everybody else out of there because we're going to stretch our shoulders and do this thing. And I get to look great because I made the purchase. It's like, oh, yeah. And if you can see yourself in the tyrants in history as well as the saints, because we're really good at, you know, seeing ourselves in the very best. <laughs> That's, you know, I mentioned to you, too, in another conversation about our personal trinity. It's self-knowledge, self-respect, and self-government. Mm -hmm. Because if you really know yourself and you go, oh, yeah, I'm capable of doing that. Oh, yeah, I'm capable of doing that other good thing. And you can respect it. 
with the full weight of, oh, I could see how under the right circumstances I could load whatever undesirable group of people onto a train to no man's land. Oh, I could see how I could do that. Oh. That degree of self-respect to realize, oh, I better keep it in line lest I start sliding down that slippery slope of compromise. As well as like, man, you're capable of such amazing stuff. Do you really respect that? Do you really see how amazing you are? Oh. Then now, how do you govern yourself with that in mind to the very best within you? Now that's conscious choice. Before that, it's just random. And that's why we're a little here, a little bit there. And, you know, our, our results are varied in our lives. So. Hmm. So, yeah, like you mentioned, like looking back at your journal and seeing your past and being like, oh, well, I'm different now and, and sort of making a, a revelation for yourself. Um, and this ties into this idea of purpose, right, which I think uh, you talk quite a bit about and like understanding who you are. Well, then you get a better understanding, right, because you're looking at your past conflicts, who you previously were, how you are now, how you act, where your ego might be, for example, um, I think, which is what you touched on. And so your purpose, where does your purpose fall into this? And does that fall into the personal trinity as well? Well, it certainly would. Yeah. You know, I love what you're saying, too. I'm just going to reflect for a moment. I, I like to think about this sometimes as a, as a vicious cycle or a nurturing cycle. It's like, yeah, when you become conscious and you know and you're doing something with what you know, it might not be pleasant sometimes. It might be glorious, glorious, right? And you do something with it. It's like, okay, now you're in the, the flow, which, you know, people are like, I love it. I feel really good. I feel, you know, on purpose in my life. Yeah, because you're actually doing something with what you know. This is great. Um, and, of course, the opposite is true when you write in your journal and you go like, yeah, well, my mom was a jerk anyway. So she's like, no, nah, you're just missing it because you're an arrogant prick still. <laughs> you know, it's like now you're just going to keep missing that. You're going to keep causing mayhem and chaos in the world. And this is why someone else is governing you because you can't get yourself to in. Mm. If you can't get yourself to clean up this part of your life, then you're probably botching it in other places. And then you're still going to be somebody else's, you know, boy, um, somebody else's little victim. So, um, yeah, the idea of purpose to me, the same identity, who am I and what's my purpose? Two of the big questions people ask themselves, you know, for, for their whole lives. Um, you know, your purpose is to be faithful to your roles. What are your roles? Well, right now you're an interviewer, you're an ally, you're a whatever, you're maybe a brother, maybe you're a, you know, you're certainly a son, you're a friend, you're a, you know, whatever other roles you have in your life. What if, if you're a doctor, you're a, and, and so the, it's like, oh, well, that seems like an interesting answer. And I'd love to hear your response. But the idea is if you can get clear, again, going, getting quiet, listening, what does it mean to be a faithful son? And really thinking that through, what does that actually mean? I mean, I call my mom once a week or dad. Does it mean I show up with a, like sincerely grateful on Father's Day versus just checking the box and phoning it? What does it mean to be faithful as a doctor? Oh, it means I should be really reading these things and doing better for great. And now you get really conscious and now you start following through. And there we are again. Now we're on that sort of that nurturing cycle, doing what we know versus the unconscious where we're just, you know, banging off the walls. Just like, I'm a good son. I'm a good father. I'm doing a good work. Yeah, but have you ever thought about what that actually really, really means? And that's a lot of work. And it's just like you do it once and it's over. So, you know, that's why living is not always easy because it's just, it's not over because you did it once. Hmm. So is it easy to self-reflect? I mean, because you, you ever read the Tao Te Ching, for example? I have, a, yeah, years ago, but yeah. Yeah, it's a, it's a book that goes over, you know, how you can look at the different polarities in this life. Uh, you can self-reflect and you can be very present, but it also has this common theme of letting things flow, letting things go. Uh, do you think it, it should be as easy as such, or do you think there is a level of work involved that involves freeing yourself? Like, where do we find that mix between, man, I got to put work into finding myself, or do I just have to sit back and, and you know, relax and just <laughs> peace my mind? Is it that simple? Like, what it, what's it sound? Isn't it confusing sometimes? It the is. Messages I mean, we let's might just hear? be honest. Yeah, it is sometimes. But I think you said it already. Is it's like there's a blend, right? Mm -hmm. It's sort of like people with the law of attraction. They think they just, you know, got to chill out and imagine a healthy body. You know, you're talking, you're being a, a health coach. It's like, yeah, that's good. Envision that. And then don't eat the damn Doritos. When you want to <laughs> pull over at the corner store and get yourself a snack because you deserve it, it's like, don't do that. So it's, there's a degree of, right. you know, sometimes you're white knuckling it, baby, and just getting to, you know, get, I remember, you know, there's been stuff that I've been like, oh, I just want to do this or I just want to eat that or whatever. 
And it's like, I promised myself, what's today, Friday? I promised I wouldn't do it until Saturday. It's like 12.01. It's like, ah, rah, rah, you know, whatever. But it's like, as bad as that has been, you know, it's like, I kept my word. Now, the spirit of the law may have been botched because it's 12.01 and I'm doing the thing. But the idea is, you know, keep your word. And so, yeah, too often the law of attraction or this, you know, receiving type thing, people don't do their work. And, you know, I look at that as the being receptive, the quiet, the law of attraction means whew, connect to yourself, connect to what you want. Yeah, be in a receptive spirit. But again, we're, we're, we're here and we've got to act in the world because in a minute, oh, what time is it? Oh, yeah, you got to get up off your mat and you're going to have to do something. What are you going to do? How are you going to act in accord with, I want to live like this, have a wonderful wife who this, and you're going to have to act in those ways in which you act, you know, who you are drives what you do and what you do creates your results. So you're going to have to get off the mat and do something. So I don't know. What do you think? It's, it's a blend, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, it certainly is. Like even this idea of inaction, I would say is still an action. You're still putting out something into the universe. Even if you're being present and, and seemingly doing nothing and you might feel like, oh yeah, I'm not contributing to the violence. That's great. And and you're aware of it. You're conscious of it. And because you're present, you're be, you're more able to see what you're doing, what you're putting out there, but you're still putting something out there. Like, right. and, and so you're still doing something. Uh, I'd say even if you're you know, meditating, but yeah, you're right. If you're meditating all day and exclude to yourself and not sharing that with others who are constantly in the rush and getting themselves all confused, uh, you know, it's, it's maybe good to have one conscious person in a mess of a hundred people who are unconscious, <laughs> but I would like to see a world where people are all free and conscious of, of their actions. Of course, you know, maybe that's, you know, this type of idealism, optimism of wanting the whole world to you know, be a certain way in the sense of conscious, but is that not what humans are meant to be is in self-control? Like don't, aren't they in the capacity to be in self-control of themselves? Well, I think so. I think so. And you know, this is to me where, you know, somebody in my shoes could get, you know, really um, dogmatic and be like, yeah, if we only did this, we only got spiritual. If you only just meditated, the world was like, that's where I'm going to go and I'm going to lean again and again and again. But the slippery slope with that is if the whole world was just as holy and wise as I am, then we could have a better world. It's like, yeah, you're lost, Ron, at that point. I will certainly say, yeah, getting quiet, listening to your intuition, slowing down, um, talking it out, using paper, paperwork instead of guns. That's probably a good idea. And there's times where a gun is going to be required. And, um, you know, so you've got to have the capacity... Actually, um, you know, there's different versions of this, but I love how Jordan Peterson talks about, you know, a, a man should be, you know, the idea of being meek in the Bible is not about being mousy. It's about having a sword, but having it sheathed and knowing when to pull it out. Hmm. So, um, yeah, I, 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 this to me feels like the same conversation as, you know, living in a stateless society. It's like, yeah, and we're all going to get together at some point I don't see it otherwise where we're going to go, look, Corey is excellent at this. Corey, are you game to do this? Yeah. And Ron, you're great at this. So can we, and then guess what's going to happen? There's going to come a time where I don't want to, or I'm going to have children and my interests are going to start moving over here and there. And we still have got to work things out. And so who's deciding what, well, Ron, if you're going to live like that, you can't live here anymore. Oh, so you're going to tell me I've got to live my, leave my little tent here. Cause I'm not welcome here anymore. And it's like, oh, yeah, you can see how the slippery slope of what are we listening to? What are we perceiving? Are we all tuned into God or whatever the right capital R thing is in a given moment? And if we were, would I see it just like you guys see it? And yes, it is time for me to move. And we bless you and wish you well. But it, it's, it is a slippery slope to think if only everybody did these four things, we would be fine. Um, because the universe, um, you know, a, a line from Emerson you know, as soon as the philosopher thinks he has it figured out, nature throws him a, a, a thousand fresh particulars to sort out with his brilliant philosophy. And here we are just trying to sort out, you know, and I think for our conversation, please tell me and jump in. Gosh, I know I want to live nonviolently as much as possible. I know that if I'm, if I talk trash to myself, I'm not bad about that. Um, but if I do that, that's violence towards myself. So in some regard. If I talk trash to you, that is certainly. Now, should you raise a hand to me? No, no. But I can certainly see then how that would require you to be a much bigger man to take that. But it doesn't surprise me when someone 
talks trash and gives somebody the finger in the on the road and somebody pulls over and slams and one little sin begets another next thing you know you've got very nasty physical violence going on so where do we start where do we start man i think it has something perhaps to do maybe if i'm you tell me if i'm wrong uh yeah, yeah, permitting no. permitting slavery uh and, and if we don't know what it is like you said like if you don't know yourself how do you know what you're getting yourself into right like it starts with being conscious of what you're putting out there. So if slavery is happening, whether you're contributing to it or other people are doing it, will you be there to see it happening? Uh, will you be the one to stop it? Uh, who will stop it if not for you? Right. These are the questions to ask. So like in a stateless society, you mentioned uh, this scenario, which kind of relates to the idea of like a lot of people ask, well, there's going to be violence. There's still going to be people doing bad things. But the question is, are they seen as legitimate? Are they going to continue 100%. in their efforts? Is everybody going to see them as a violent gang or, is, or, or are people going to see them as some special group of human beings who have any more rights than another being? But then that's inequality. And if they have the ability to do that, they get to decide how other people's rights are and trample upon their rights. Are they not claiming to be the slave master? Isn't that something? And I really appreciate this conversation because so often, like I said, I, my experience with um, actually, it's less people who consider themselves volunteerists. I know at the end of the day, they're really the same, but people who are, you know, it's like, I'm an anarchist, stateless, you know, no, it's all it's like we, we, they're not having this sort of a nuanced conversation. And I know it's been had many times, but this is the, this is the challenge. Um, I don't recall, what was the thing you said when you first started talking? It, uh, it made me think about, well, ultimately it's, yeah, it's like, who, who's going to decide this? Who's going to decide that? And, have you ever heard, it's, a, it's an old Bedouin saying, but it's me against my brother, me and my brother against our cousin, mm. me and my brother and my cousin against that. the stranger. So yeah, the last part is me, my brother, and my cousin against the stranger. And the idea is there's sort of something in our human nature where it's like, I want to be left alone. Like, leave me alone. I'll, I'll trade coconuts with you and dollars or bottles of this or whatever. We're cool. But uh, now you're messing with, okay, you're messing with me. You're my brother. Back off, man. Like, this is my territory. You're not hunting on my, oh, wait, our cousin now is bringing six guys over. You and I are now united, right? Because it's a bigger something. Oh, our cousin was being a punk, but now we see this large tribe who's doing this whole thing to the, you know, the whole Renaud family. Now it's all of us against a stranger. So there's this thing, and I don't know if it's human nature, it's like a computer, it is just in there, it's a hard, hard hardware, not a software thing, or what? Seems to be to be hardware. Um, and if that's the case, it's almost like we're, oh, there's always something, and I see it within myself, I see it within others. And this to me is the conversation then about biography as history is, I can see that discomfort with myself, you know, um, the world is moving. Things are shifting. It's not like it's just static. And so I move, I shift. I'm, oh, I'm disappointed. I didn't do this. And so I'm having to grow and move. And there's like, there's a friction within myself going mm. on. And so for us, it's going to be with you. Of course, it's going to be over here. How do we interact in a way that, um, right. We're not, in, we're not, we're not, um, underwriting, you know, a group of thugs and saying that what they're doing is legitimate. But if you do X, Y, Z and I, you know, go over and, or we'll make, make it me, but somebody else, I do something foolish and somebody just comes and punches my lights out that we all don't go, yeah, Ron had it coming. <laughs> Cause if Ron had it coming, then that might've been the appropriate action to take is, Oh yeah, I guess you shouldn't hunt on my property anymore, Ron. And that, that's kind of the right thing to have happened. And we didn't empower, you know, 600 people to, to come over, or we didn't have to pay taxes for it to have one representative come over and beat me up. It's like, no, this guy cleaned it up. Um, voluntary, it, yeah. Voluntarily, and the the rest of the tribe can go. Yeah, you, you kind of you probably shouldn't have punched him a second time, but you got him. And you know, Ron, keep keep your temper in order and don't do anything more. Did you learn your lesson? Cool. Now, and responsibility. This is my book. This is the last. Exactly. I think I caught you. What'd you say? Responsibility. <laughs> responsibility. And to me, it's the there's 21 chapters in my book. They're pretty short, but the 20th chapter is mercy, grace, and forgiveness. You have got to then restore Ron to your community. Because if Ron is the jerk that went hunting on Corey's property and like the Renauds are always doing that, we, we build the story. Now the Renauds are outcasts. Now you're creating the, the mess versus, look, Ron took the punch. <laughs> 
he paid Corey, um, you know, he gave him two deer. And that's an old biblical thing is like, you know, you tried to, you were going to try to get a deer or a thousand dollars, we'll say out of it. Then you have to restore the thousand dollars as well as what you hope to profit. So I would owe you two. So I gave you two deer. It's over gone. And now Ron is restored into the community, fully restored as a guy who learned his lesson. He made up, you know, there was the, 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 um, you know, everything was cleaned up financially or, you know, otherwise, and now it's good. It, there's no more residue. Those are the types of communities that I think we can, you know, really round this corner and create some peace in. But I don't know. Have you heard about this? My understanding is there's like all sorts of studies that's like once groups go over about 150, there's some number where it gets to be so big that there, it, it, there needs to be some sort of, it, it leans towards there's always going to be a group that gets created. You can't have a sort of a commune uh, bigger than a certain number. Otherwise, it turns into something backed by coercion. Hmm. So that's inter interesting to me. But anyway, I, don't, I hope we're not diverting from your original. No, or no, that's, that's a good point to mention. It's like, where, where do you draw the line? When does violence get introduced into society? When is it legitimized? Uh, how is it uh, legitimized? And again, I think it goes back to like the previous points you mentioned, where it's like, are we realizing our own actions? Are we realizing the actions of others? Because we can prevent violence from happening, right? With our knowledge. Uh, if, if we stay ignorant of that knowledge or ignorant of what's happening, what would cause us to be ignorant? Maybe we're maybe we're consuming all our news from the television. Maybe the news is actually the issue itself because it's not allowing us to use our own eyes and look outside the world around us. And we're dependent on one source of information. You know, it could be as simple as that. Uh, deceiving people or giving the wrong information or not allowing us to see enough information. Uh, but I think what you really touched on was this law of rhythm, right? Because you're, you're saying, you know, if this person does this, this will happen. If this will happen within the mind, another thing will happen. And this also this other idea that you mentioned called uh, self-sabotage, mm -hmm. right? So law of rhythm and, and self-sabotage. Uh, what what would you have to say about that? I know the law of rhythm is like a hermetic principle, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, and I'm not uh, as well versed as I'd like about you know uh, the Kabbalion and you know each of the laws, but um, you know the law of rhythm is is well, it's not the recognition, but recognizing the law of rhythm, one would see that you know, um, well, let's do it within you know oneself first. Is you know there's the it's like I'm going to get an ultra great shape. And then I fall off the wagon and it comes back this way. And it's like, oh man, I'm eating Ben and Jerry's and I'm this and that. And the idea, of course, is to not swing so violently, but to find that rhythm within that's, you know, I often do is I train coaches as well. And I'll often go like this, your job is to align people, integrity to integrate good or truth within them. Bang, lock that in. And so the same thing with the law, you know, of rhythm, but there's going to be an inhale, law of rhythm. Um, there's going to be an exhale. There's up, down, over, under, um, the systast, uh, systole and diastole of the heart. Like there, it's you just can't have static. It's what it's it's the oxygen. It's the exhale and the and the uh, plants that are bringing in that uh, carbon dioxide and giving us the oxygen. It's it's the circle. It's the pattern of life. Well, within that, this beautiful tree is going to come out of the earth, and it's going to fall down, corrupt, and it's going to feed worms and ants and, you know, bears are going to be able to eat the, the honey for, that the bees make in the, uh, in the nest within the tree's rotting trunk. Um, and so what, we, what, what happens is when life happens, things, something smacks us that we're not expecting, what do we do? Do we sabotage and go like, I, I, you know, I'm so dislocated from myself. I'm so sad. I'm so unable to handle this. So what do I do? I go pick up my drug of choice, whatever that is. Um, you know, again, it could be sleep. It could be, you know, being sarcastic. It could be, you know, what do we do to got to get control in a situation? Um, and I think it's oftentimes in those moments where we, we set a course that really shoots us in the foot because look, we're all doing good when we're doing good. Uh, but how do we handle it? The no. How do we handle the tough times? How do we handle the crap hitting the fan or, or whatever else? Um, you know, one of the things is people will talk about, well, they're, the, the people who are doing this to us are this and that. And, <laughs> and they're like, oh, wow. And I see it in themselves, others, and I see it in myself. And I think, I don't want to be that emotional, that out of control. I don't want to be doing Klaus Schwab's work where I am miserable living now. 
uh, and that's buying into the pendulum swing, buying into like, believe that it's all going to be only getting worse. Believe what we're telling you about the law of rhythm. Believe that it's this. Believe that the, you are incapable. Believe that we are the authority and we're going to control you one way or another. Believe it. And when we give in emotionally, we're, we're, we've made ourselves slaves of these people who are, you know, the sad part is it might even be worse than the people who are more asleep, um, who are subject to the dictates of these folks and don't know it. We, we know what they're doing and we're subjecting ourselves to it. So it's like, oh, so there's your self-sabotage. So what do yeah. we do? Whew, back within, know the truth and don't compromise. Know the truth. Okay, this is what's going on. They're doing, boy, they're killing deer in Texas. Oh, they just slaughtered a bunch of people on their own property. They're chickens in Kentucky. Oh, okay. So my plan to get chickens. So what can happen is, you know, up here in New Hampshire, I can either get angry and this and that, or I can go, okay. That means I've got to get better. I've got to get more crafty. I've got to be more thoughtful. I've got to be more deliberate about what I do to provide for myself and my family. And the choice is either to become more free, more awake, more enlightened, more empowered, and do something with what I know, or to start trailing on down. Mm. Succumb. So, what yeah, are we like, do? like succumb, you know, like yes. to fate. Yeah, this let, let life control you, or, or are you in control of your own life? Yeah. Yeah, like get 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 grasped by the tornado, or you know, run away from the tornado. Take action, do something about it. Yeah, before it hits. No, you. it's coming. Build a damn shelter. Jump <laughs> right. in the shelter. Yeah, and there's signs. Mess, yeah, but, but you're alive, and now you can go do something. <laughs> yeah. So now it, it, your opportunity is in your hands. So it, yeah, it's very a self powering empowering thing, and it's something that I, I do wish was taught more in the school system is empowerment in general. Um, I, I thought a long time ago of doing a, a course just on empowerment and creating something like that. But, uh, of course this is, I think this is the value in coaching. You know, a lot of people yeah, undervalue coaching. A lot of people don't know like what it is. And I think it's the future. You see a lot of people, you know, they don't want to deal with the, the, the debt going to being a doctor. Like I didn't want to go into the debt of being a doctor, but yet one year of coaching schools and, and getting involved with experiences where I, I, I work with doctors or I can just talk with clients. That's my experience. That's my learning. I learn through them. They learn through me. I think it's a very magical process. And it's one that shows you that the everyday person can be the person that helps the everyday person. It doesn't yes. have to be this person with this special authority or special eight years of schooling and loads of debt, right? I think the old systems are starting to fail us and we're waking up to the new systems, but because of our moral revolution, our knowledge revolution. And so I think you you really hit it on the nail and with like the, the law of uh, rhythm. So like one thing that you mentioned too was like you mentioned anarchism and voluntarism. This is something important to mention for those out there. Um, I call myself an abolitionist because I like to focus on the idea of slavery. <laughs> so um, I like to get right to the heart of the moral cause. And I don't know what your thoughts are about that. I want to hear more about what you mean, like define abolitionism. I mean, I can kind of make it up, but mm -hmm. that's not as good as you actually telling me. So, <laughs> yeah. So, well, I could bring it into the last point I, I said. So like Great. as society has moved on, right, we went 4,000 years with slavery, chattel slavery in particular, which when I say slavery, most people are going to think chattel slavery, ball right. and chain somebody you know hooked up on, on a ball and chain and they're like have a slave master physical where they're on a plantation well there's other forms of slavery that's one form of slavery and it's the one that we got rid of about 200 years ago which in my eyes is not that long ago honestly um, and that's in america but yet we know it's going on in other parts of the world yeah um and even i'll just throw in and i want you to of course keep going but when i was in dubai 10 years ago um, buddy of mine, super duper wealthy guy, starts taking me around to all these cool places, and I was cool. And he goes, "Do you see over there?" And I go, "Yeah, yeah." He goes, "All those guys are from Pakistan. They're all wearing blue jumpsuits." I go, "Okay." He goes, "They get brought in with the promise that they're going to make all this money, and they do, but they also take their passports from them. And what they're doing is they're making money. They're sending it home." And the boss, I forgot the other part of it, was like the boss takes a bunch of money back or whatever. But basically, they're kept there, unable to make enough money to actually get back. And their passports have been taken from them. So they're essentially slaves. Hmm. So it's like, you know, we have this idea of like, slavery is black people coming from Africa to the United States of America, who's wicked and evil 
and you know we, we can go into all that but it's like yeah but if we're really concerned about slavery it's still going on what are we going to do about it but i don't want to take you off your point yeah. but it's it's still here and oh, in other yeah. ways i think is your point too right Slavery is an action, right? And it, yeah. and it manifests into a condition, which we may say is, is slavery. So that is why I, I like to use the word abolitionism, because it's focusing on getting rid of a certain action, one that we can identify. If you start mentioning anarchism and all this other stuff, you start getting into philosophical debates where people have their own biases and ideologies. And what we're doing is not an ideology. What we're doing is trying to end violence. It's a specific action, right? Uh, slavery is essentially violence or violating somebody else's rights. It's claiming ownership over somebody else's life or property. So what would include their property? Maybe it's that freedom, right? Which we, we recognize ha comes with self-control. So you have to be responsible for your freedom, which is a form of property. So you essentially have to control your own property. Otherwise, who does that property belong to? somebody else. So uh, that's why I use the word abolitionism, if that makes it easier. You can look at it through multiple lens, but essentially it's just defining what slavery is and recognizing that it's wrong. Which... I'm not for that. I'm for abolishing that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. Recognizing that slavery is wrong. So abolishing that comes the word abolition. Abolition. Yeah. So um, let's let's go a little bit now into that. Right. So people can understand, like, what do we mean when we use these words? Anarchism, voluntarism, slavery. Uh, how would you coach somebody into learning what slavery is or statism, for example? And how do these relate? OK, so people come to me because they and I use sort of these stereotypical examples, but like they want to lose 20 pounds. They want to make a million dollars. They want to get closer to God. They want to find a great wife. They want to enjoy better relationships with whomever. Cool. All good. Um, it isn't my job to tell them about coercion per se, right? That's my stuff. Now it's like, oh, you're going to give me some money? Well, let me tell you what I think. No, no, no. My job is to draw from you what I would say is wisdom. Now, my definition of coaching is when a coach and a client, when two people come together and are present in the moment, and it's like that's when you're present with there's a line in the Bible where it says, where two or more are gathered in my name, so I am there, or so there am I, or something like that. And the idea, in, in my mind, is where two or more are gathered in the name of truth, that's where God is, that's where good is, that's where truth, capital T, is. Um, actually, we should talk about, I love making the distinction between capital T truth and lowercase t truth and my truth. That might be a fun, if we, get a, if we have a minute for that. But um, uh, the idea is, I'm not there to, tell people what to do, but to draw out from them. In doing this, what I'm going to notice is, you know, you keep, uh, you know, you're exercising all the time. Cool. Um, but your girlfriend misses you and you're like, yeah, well, whatever, man, I just got to get the six pack back and I got to this and that. And I might, might be able to reveal like, Hey man, just noticing. It's like, you're talking about wanting to be close to your girlfriend, but the six pack theme seems to be trumping the like, oh, yeah, and, and I might help you see if it's true. I mean, my job is not to tell you, like, this is what it is. I'm trying to make you go within. And if you're being honest with yourself, you're going to maybe go, oh, yeah, Ron, I see how I'm doing this. I see how I'm setting myself up. I see how I'm shoot shooting myself in the foot and creating the very thing I, you know, I, I don't want. Um, now I'm forgetting the point. What were you, what was the first, well, what was the original question? No, that's, that's perfect that you brought that up because I think, do we ever tie that into politics? And, and I agree with oh. you, like I'm in that health field, right? Yeah, and yeah. there's so many health coaches out there who focus on helping people with their lifestyle and their bodies and nutrition, but yet politics takes up so much room of people's lives and so much energy and, and attention is put onto it. But and people in the medicine field are afraid to touch the subject. And, you know, I wouldn't expect, I, I don't go over it with my clients necessarily, but they can look into my views on that, of course, if they want to. But the point is, I agree. It is about taking it out of an individual, finding it within themselves. Because if there's universal truth, if we could all understand what slavery is, if we could all understand violence is wrong and that it may be occurring, then I don't need to convince anybody of anything, right? Like yeah, you right. said. So, right. so yeah, that, that oh, my was job or your question. job is to be an example for people um, to make sure we're living it clean with, you know, our own lives, doing our work. Um, not that you're perfect because I'm not perfect, but to continually be doing our work. I, the tie in, I think the reason I brought up the, um, you know, maybe in this example view is what I might say is, you know, I'm going to point to you being your own inner authority. And yeah, no wonder, um, trying to think of how to tie it back with, with that particular example. But, you know, yeah, man, so long as you're not governing yourself, so long as you're not doing what you know here, 
there's going to be something else governing you. And it sounds like it's, you know, your past or the kid from high school that told you you'd always be skinny. So you got to really prove him wrong. And you're still, you're a slave of this kid from 20 years ago. Like, oh my gosh. And then, you know, I don't, again, I don't drive anybody to anything, but I'll, I might check it. If I did that with you and you're like, you're right, Ron, I'm, I'm buying into authority. I'm like, yeah, I mean, that's what the government does too. It's what our churches do. It's like, and I'll, I will occasionally float stuff out there just to go, yeah, the fucking Democrats and the Republicans, they both, da, da, da. I mean, I know there's an American centric conversation we're having and viewers might be from wherever, but the, the Labor Party, as well as the conservative, you know, whatever your blue and red team is, um, it's like, yeah, to help people begin to go, oh, right. And I'm going to tell people again and again, the, the point is, is self-government, self-knowledge, self-respect, self-government. If you can govern yourself, you don't need anybody else telling you what to do. So you do your work, brother or sister, you know, so. If I go down that road at all with people, just floating the ideas out, contextualizing what is true within and how it's going to affect their happiness, you know, outside themselves. So is that a coincidence that like, for example, if, if somebody is in charge of their own health, right, they, yeah, yeah. they know what how their body reacts to certain foods, they know what they should eat. Uh, is it a coincidence that they no longer are dependent on authority uh, because for, for their health. And is it a coincidence that we can apply that same analogy in health That's great. to, to politics or, or maybe that will naturally happen within an individual's mind because they're starting to connect the dots for themselves. See, maybe I, we don't even need to mention politics to them. Why should we, right? We don't like politics. I don't like politics that much. Um, I, I don't think it's even something that's necessarily ne needed to be talked about, right? Is it even based in reality? Is it something that we really need? But but I think they can start con con to connect the dots themselves once they start recognizing um, their own health. Like for me, my journey started in health. When I started eating better foods, my mind was working better. When I started taking in charge of my own health, I started connecting the dots to politics naturally. And I feel like that would happen with a lot of people. Sometimes maybe the approach is not to start where politics is or not to start where statism is uh, and say, well, look, authority is the problem. Maybe the problem, oh, yeah. you know, where we have to start is the individual, like you said and fix their diet first, fix, fix what's going on within their own mind. Yeah. A hundred percent. Yeah. I mean, I, 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 like, so I do not teach people, you know, without their permission, you, you can't do it. If you've got an agenda for somebody without it being super overt, it just gets weird and it's a weird relationship. However, and you know, everybody, how we interact with anybody, it's, you know, it's, a, you've got to see what's true and right for you. And for as you as a coach, you're going to do what your version is. I'll do mine. But to me is I'm trying to unslave every single human I, I can. And you've got your version of that. Um, and it's like, oh, can I, where else can I help them see? Oh, can I make the connection that this guy can't stand going to church now? Um, yeah. Like, do you see the same thing here? It's like, yeah, why can't you sing go to church? Cause they just, they want you to do this. They expect you to blah, blah, blah. Right. So what I'm hearing, tell me if I'm off and I'm always open to someone saying, no, no, it's not that Ron. It's more like this is here. What I'm hearing is like, you're wanting to listen as we've talked about, you know, like go to yourself deeper that you at a deeper level rather than this sort of the external authority telling you how to live, what to do, what, what God says, like you want to find it within. Yes. Great. So I'm always open to pointing that out. Like I said, you can't just do it. Otherwise, it's like a weird agenda that you're trying to mm -hmm. slip in at any given moment. But yeah, man, if I can help people see the, the, the ways in which they enslave themselves, the sooner the better, right? And Yeah, if, if they're doing it to themselves, then I think, like I said, it's more of a natural trans, transformation, yeah. right? We don't have to put it force upon it. If anything, uh, you know, who's <laughs> we're looking at politics where force is applied to make people do certain things. And as coaches, we're doing the exact opposite, you know, the opposite. And, I, and it's good to be the change. It's good to walk the talk and show like, hey, this is how we support each other without violence. This is how we get things done without authority. Look within yourself and you don't need external, you know, sources of information. A great example. You know, I had a, uh, I've, I've still have him, a client that I work with and I, um, he was super psyched about the shot. And I was like, dude, I said, can I, can I throw something over? And he said, sure, sure. And I said, listen, I'm really concerned about you. You know, I know you're psyched about getting it. I, I'm not. And here's my concern. Okay. And I said, well, actually I asked permission, you know, can I throw you a concern I have about the shot? Oh yeah. Yeah. Go ahead. Da, 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 da. And he goes, yeah, no, I hear you Ron, but I'm getting it because of X, Y, Z, one, two, three. Never spoke about it again. Yeah. And to me, it's like, and you know, we all have agendas for each other. You've got an agenda for me being here. I've got an agenda for being here. 
And just that as long as we're open about it and cool and it's an exchange right. and we're happy, we're good. And the same thing with this coaching thing goes, if I can be overt with my agenda for him when, I, when I'm noticing come up and, and he can be really clear, no, I don't want what you're selling. Great. Great. Now we're all at choice. There's no coercion. Hmm. We can be still yourself. dance together. Yeah. 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 So yeah, you're, you're being authentic, right? You're not trying to be somebody just as you would want the individual you're talking to to also be themselves and define themselves, which is the whole purpose. So yeah, you're, you're definitely walking the talk, which is which is great. So uh, I have a final question for you, I think, uh, to wrap up the, the last part of this interview. And it's been so nice talking with you. Uh, I want to ask your personal experience now just a little bit, and maybe that can help uh, time with other people and how they're you know, going about with their life. How did you break free from this thing we call statism, uh, what I call mental slavery? Uh, mm. How did you break out of this? And, and just to clarify for people, you know, when I say statism or mental slavery, it's believing that you are meant to be a slave and have a slave master. It's a great question, and uh, I'll say thank you before we go any further. Just thanks for having me, and it's been great. And, you know, it's obviously we could keep going in a hundred different directions. <laughs> this is a great question. You know, you can tell by, I'm, I'm guessing, they tell me if I'm off, but by how I've, you know, jumped out of the gate, you know, probably 10 minutes in talking about how volunteerists or anarchists can be, you know, the can act in ways that sort of require someone to, control their behavior because they they're so free and they can they can do whatever they want it's like that doesn't work and so nature will like you can you can be free and smoke all you want but nature is going to exact a cost it's like you're you're free but not free from the consequences my journey was to truly really recognizing i would say that or some some version of that um which is you know uh, recognition of the law of cause and effect I, I remember graduate uh, in high school, we had to register to vote and I just knew the Democrats were idiots. So, you know, and that's not me, a commentary. That's just kind of my judgment when I was 18. And uh, so I was a Republican and um, that was in 1991. And then in 92, was it 92? Was it 92? I think Ross Perot ran against Bush and Clinton. I think it was because then Clinton won. And it was the first time I heard a politician talk where he actually made sense. And Ross Pro did make sense. And I think he was sort of a gateway. He, I know it was a gateway drug for me, so to speak. But it got me thinking about conservatism. I listened to Rush Limbaugh for a while. And I was like, of course, Bill Clinton's a, you know, an idiot. You know? And it was, again, I wasn't thinking, but I was beginning to see that freedom mattered. And some of what Limbaugh said, a lot of what he said at the time made sense. I then became, a, a, after 9-11, it was like, you know, damn it, those guys that did this to us, we're going to, we, just, you know, I was like, oh my gosh, I was really ready to go to Iraq and go to wherever they told me to go. And that was probably at one point the highest, you know, peak I had been towards loving liberty and freedom and the lowest, because my reaction was like, go, go kill people that didn't do anything to me or anybody in America in order to, uh, you know, demonstrate my love of liberty. It's insane, but that's where I was. But it wasn't long after that I realized 9-11 was not what we were told that I started unpacking acting more and more and more and more quickly. I became a really strict constitutionalist and I held on to that for a long time. Um, Mark Passio, somebody turned me on to him, say four years ago. And it was right around the time where it was, I knew the constitution wasn't, there was something that wasn't cool with it. There was something, you know, whether you call it a conspiracy in Philadelphia that had it even come to pass and the story of it you know, oh, the, the articles of confederation weren't strong enough and therefore, but I was still, I was, I was still buying, drinking the Kool-Aid, so to speak. Um, but then I started realizing, oh, wait, but under this great constitution, America has got bases in like 180 nations around the world. We've bombed the living daylights out of everybody. We finance both sides of we. Um, Americans or so-called Americans have financed the rise of, you know, Stalin, the Bolshevik revolution, right? St uh, uh, not communism we financed the rise of, um, uh, Hitler from the twenties financed the Chinese communists blockaded Taiwan and told Chiang Kai-shek if he came across to kill the communists, we would bomb the hell out of Taiwan. And that was the moment I was like, hold on. And that actually happened around 2003. That's when I started like this stuff started happening more and more. I was still a constitutionalist holding on, holding on. And then finally I went, wait a second, this is just not going to work with a massive central authority. 
that just says, oh, there's a problem. Wait, wait, there's a problem. Oh, look, it's already into law. Now we can do it. Oh, oh, it's too late. But you voted for it. I didn't vote for it. Well, you're representative. I don't represent me half the time or as much as I'd like. I don't think you're going to tell me this guy represents 400,000 people and can vote and bind us all. Yeah. Then it started unwinding so quickly. A buddy of mine, a guy that I just met, was uh, identified as an anarchist. And uh, I thought it was crazy at first, but it made sense. Uh, Another buddy of mine gave me the term volunteerist. And that's what I hold on to because I don't have it all sorted out. I don't know about no rulers whatsoever, ever. But I do think there are going to be authorities, political, if you want to call it that, or or, um, something along those lines. But I... And I haven't studied all political, all systems, but I know, I do believe that there is some system that allows people to come and go. But I believe that there's like, so that there's, that I can choose to be underneath the authority, come and go as I would want, or I would be wanted. And in that regard, I choose to put myself under the authority of chief big, you know, 10 bears or whatever. And it's like, in that regard, that makes sense. And I could live like that, but just voting for team red or team blue and however that manifests. Um, it stopped making sense a few years ago. I know it's a long, long version, but um, yeah, you can see I'm still wrestling with it because it's not just black and white. Like if we just got rid of all leaders, the world would be great because we haven't taken care of this part yet. And we're just going to get the guy with the biggest guns and the biggest, and then then whoever's the craftiest and has the most money, who's going to hire the uh, the the mercenaries to do their dirty work. They're just going to take charge again. So we need a personal ref- reformation of each individual. That's, there's no shortcuts. So, do you think your coaching principles kind of give you a, a little leverage into that insight? <laughs> well, you know what, man, it's all I think about. And uh, again, again, that's why you know you read that bio from my my website, right? It's like I I believe that we're only going to have the the revolution and have the peace and the freedom that we want when we do have um, an internal revolution. And more and more and more individuals have just got to have it, and it just has to, it's going to be mostly energetic. Because if we're just going to do a bloody revolution, it's just going to be taken back from us. And somebody with bigger guns or more guns or more endurance or better resources are going to just take it back over from us. And that would make sense because we uh, overawed somebody with violence and now it was our turn. That's the law of rhythm for you too. Oh, shucks. <laughs> so thank you for sharing. Peace, brother. Thank you What's for that? sharing that story. I appreciate it. Oh, you're welcome. Thanks for asking. Yeah. How many years were, would you say you were a statist in your life? <laughs> Well, I'm 49. Uh, if I'm going to really, you know, kind of tough on myself, f- I would say four years ago is when the dam broke. Okay. Yeah. And now I love your definition of statism because there are those in our community that would still say I'm a statist. And I'm like, yeah, I would say I'm not really a statist, but there's something that I'm trying to sort out mm-hmm. while not endorsing this monstrosities right that overall us but uh yeah for for most of my life my friend but you know what's great is um you know i've reared my children to to know the things that i know now um you know and they went from you know like me loving the constitution and george washington to going oh well maybe this and that and they've got more and more nuanced understandings which is great imagine having that at 17 and 18 for crying out loud now i mean they're their own men they're going to sort it out on their own but that's pretty cool if this movement gets to grow and we have children and they begin exactly. to see things, right? I think we fear about all these things and all these possibilities. Meanwhile, if we just follow our hearts, our, our morals and what we share and just get this knowledge out there, if it's not out there at all, especially just in the first place, I think the conversation can take it from there. The The mass public can, everything will just start to, I think, go to come together. I mean, think about it. The abolitionists in the 1800s, I always refer to them, especially in my book, and they didn't know how to end slavery. They're like, you know, this is a big step in history. 4,000 years of a practice that causes all this economic trade and picks all this cotton. Like, everybody's like, how is the world going to work without slavery? But it didn't matter to them all these small questions because the morality of it was that they were meant to be free. So That's no it. questions asked. Anything will make things work if if it is intended for people to be free. You know, if, if that is what life intends and every sign and every direction saying, yes, be in self-control, take control of your health, take control of your life, be conscious as you, uh, conscious, as you said, then that is the end of slavery. <laughs> you named it, you know, like to me, it's do right now. And you can look at that three different ways, like do, do something, do right now, or do right. 
now or you know do right now so there's like three different ways the idea is what's the right thing to do they didn't know how to end slavery but they did the right thing to the best of their ability now again and again and again many went to jail many died many were you know had everything taken from them we love our lives too much we love our comforts and our nice right. water our nice things too much but things are getting worse and we're starting and to pick up at some point we're going to be yeah. making decisions right there's a there's a way yeah 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 there's a there's a great line and i'll, I'll you know, I'll, I'll let you do your rap here, but uh, if uh, for those who, of you who haven't read, go read um, Henry David Thoreau's um, On the Duty of Civil Disobedience. But there's a great line in there where he was talking about um, both the Mexican War and slavery. And he said, cast your whole vote, not merely a slip of paper. And so basically live like you really want to end slavery rather than just vote for the guy that says he won't do slavery. You, you don't put down a slave rebellion. You get in the way to slow down the troops that are on their way to put down the slave rebellion. You get invited. You do something. Cast your whole vote. And that sticks with me. And it's so um, convicting because, man, how are you doing? How am I doing at casting my whole vote? That's beautiful. So. Yeah, like just what we contribute in the world, not just that, our fruits of our labor, right? Where we put our yeah. money, that's our vote. Yeah, I love it. That's a great quote. I, I actually love their works as well, uh, Henry David Thoreau and ralph waldo emerson the oh good is that right great yeah i love i love that stuff everybody i feel like has something to offer so uh definitely i love talking to you today that was great I, and i hope we can collaborate more in the future that'd be great that'd <laughs> yeah. be great we have a newspaper that i plan on starting called the liberator 2 which is going to continue the old liberator newspaper from the 1800s it was an abolition abolitionist newspaper and uh, yeah. i would love if you uh could contrib contribute to it later on when we start that project uh but yeah, thank you so much for sharing everything. And <laughs> thank you everybody out there for watching. If you want to check out more of Ron Renaud's work, uh, again, check out his book, Uncompromised, when you're ready to live your life on your terms. And feel free to also get the Uncompromised journal uh, so you can journal a bit more about that. We talked about the importance of journaling. His website is ronrenaud.com, R O N R E N A U D.com. And if you want to see a lot more talks like this, uh, if you want to see a whole bunch more speakers, go to nita.one slash summit, nita.one slash summit, and you'll see the end of slavery summit. I am always glad to bring on different perspectives. We have many different people from all sorts of different backgrounds, and we all agree that something is not right <laughs> and we need to free ourselves. <laughs> so thank you very much, Ron. Yeah. Thanks very much for having me, Corey.